with Teens in the Driver's Seat Teen Advisory Board. Thank you for attending today's session. Here are some tips to help make this session a great experience. We are committed to saving lives and reducing crashes on our roads and request each participant commit to connecting to our event from a safe location. Please do not connect while driving or operating any form of machinery. First, notice a panel to the right with several tabs. Here is where you can chat, ask questions, retrieve handouts, and see answered polls. The chat is public and you are encouraged to say hello and answer any prompts that appear there. If you have questions, post those in the Q&A window. Any handouts can be downloaded from that tab. And finally, poll questions will appear directly on your screen. The price drawing for a $50 gift card will be held at the end of this session, so make sure you stay on for that. Finally, at the conclusion of the webinar, please complete a very quick survey for this session, which will help the presenter and us improve in the future. Lastly, we hope you enjoy the session.
Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Christine Yeager, and I am a project specialist in the Teens in the Driver's Seat program. Our next presenter is Dr. Chip Rout from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. Dr. Rout is a native of Chapel Hill, Texas, graduating summa cum laude from Texas A&M University. His orthopedic traumatology fellowship was at the University of Washington's Harborview Medical Center. He remained there as faculty from 1989 to 2012. Dr. Rout is best known as a tireless and devoted physician surgeon and a passionate teacher. Please help me welcome Dr. Rout. I thank y'all for having me. My name is Chip Rout, and I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon at uh, in Houston, Texas, at the University of Texas Health Medical School, the McGovern Medical School, and I work at uh, Texas Medical Center at Memorial Hermann Hospital doing uh, orthopedic traumatology, and I work with this uh, crew of other orthopedic uh, trauma surgeons. We're a part of a big team in the University of Texas uh, Department of Orthopedics, and. Um, you know, I've been tasked to talk to you all about uh, what I do and sort of where I came from and how the seatbelt safety and uh, vehicular safety has an impact on, on what I do. Uh, seems like it wasn't that long ago that I was uh, growing up in Chapel Hill, Texas, right outside of Brenham. I lived on a farm out there. I was born in 57, went to Brenham High School, finished in 76. That's my prom, prom picture. Uh, my date and me, you know, my boutonniere on, and then I started working in hospitals in the Brenham Hospital area, uh, the little hospital we had in my hometown when I was in, uh, 19 years old in the summers, and then during college I worked there. I went to Texas A&M for college, and then back in those days there was a three-year program to go to medical school, and I went to medical school in Galveston, the University of Texas Medical Branch, and uh, then I finished there, went to Vanderbilt for my residency in orthopedic surgery, that ended up being about grade 25 when you get through with all that training. And then I went to the University of Washington. I worked there for 25 years. Then I moved back to Houston in 2013 on January 1st, and I started my, my work here. So that's that's my story and how I got here. And uh, I lived out in the country, and you can see I went my first vehicle after a bicycle, after a my first vehicle was a mule, then a horse, then a 57 Willis Jeep, and then a motorcycle. So what I do is now I take care of people who have had vehicular, usually vehicular trauma, car wrecks, uh, motorcycle wrecks, uh, any type of injury that injures the bone. And some of you are probably uh, maybe fans of the MMA and things like that. And recently there was a fighter that was injured and you know had immediate orthopedic recognition as a result of the tibia fracture. And this is just a X-ray of the bones of the legs when the bones break and you can see the larger of the two bones is the tibia or the shin bone, and the smaller of the two bones is the fibula. And we see many of these, but in traumatology, it's not just simple fractured care. Traumatology is different. We take care of people who have had a lot of injuries, and a lot of times our patients have almost everything broken, including their spleens and their livers and their lungs and their heads and things like that. So it's not always just a, a simple little break of the bone like you see here, but it comes in a, 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 a wrapping that's been involved as well, and I won't uh, get into too much of the gore, but we just take care of a lot of patients with some pretty terrible injuries as a result of their vehicular trauma. Traumatology is a, is a uh, I guess as a subspecialty started in the Civil War when they started to organize field hospitals, but traumatology got really a lot of uh, attention on November 22nd, 63, when uh, our president and our uh, state governor here in Texas, uh, John Kennedy, and then uh, John Connolly, when they were, uh, President Kennedy was assassinated and Governor Connolly was shot. And there was really not a plan of where to go and things like that. Luckily, they were nearby in Parkland in Dallas, and they got them there and were able to get some care for them there. But all of these things that today we see with uh, transport, on-scene care, transportation, trauma centers, regionalization of trauma care, it's all been developed since the 60s. And as far as seatbelt safety goes, some of you are 
and I think we're all pretty focused on seatbelt. You know, m my career would probably be about one tenth as busy it is, as it is if, if people um, wore seatbelts and quit drinking and driving. Nevertheless, the seatbelts really started with an orthopedic surgeon. And you can see, you can see here is John States, Dr. John States and his dad, and his Dr. John States and his two kids in the back seat in their little car. But uh, it's amazing when you see this picture of and you think that Dr. States spent his career devoted to trying to get seatbelt safety um, laws and mandatory seat mandatory seatbelt laws passed. This guy was extremely persistent, um, and eventually, after starting his work in the late 1950s, in 1983, it was finally signed into law uh, that all states were participating in mandatory seatbelt laws. So. It took a long time uh, for seatbelts to become uh, federal law, but uh, so be it. And since then, you know, countless lives have been saved and trauma survivorship is way up as a result of people that do uh, wear their belt. And we see it's incredible injury mitigation as a result of safety issues is um, from the airbags and things like that, but mostly just from people wearing uh, the proper seatbelts and, and lap belts and harnesses. So Dr. States, if you don't know where seatbelts sort of why we've got them, it's because of an orthopedic surgeon in Rochester, New York, and you see him right there. When I was in high school, you know, I hung out with these guys, especially this is uh, three of my very good friends and teammates, and uh, we got along very well. We, we had a very, very small high school in Brenham, but we had some trouble start in December of 74, and the seatbelt uh, thing really, uh, or the lack of seatbelt laws in those days, really hurt us. And I'm just going to go through my own personal experience with sort of one of the things that led me to become a physician, but also some pretty sentinel moments in my career or my life uh, because of just loss. And these are uh, nine of my classmates that had uh, adverse events as a result of uh, some version of vehicular trauma and not being belted. And I'll just start with uh, what would have been our class valedictorian girl that I shared birthday with, and she uh, was probably the smartest uh, kid in our high school. Her mother was my third grade teacher. Dad was our elementary school principal, and she was uh, killed uh, on Christmas Eve of 74 um, when uh, she was uh, injured by a train. And uh, those days, there weren't a lot of uh, um, warning signs. And uh, as a result of uh, just not wearing the seatbelt and then the train accident, uh, she was killed at the scene. One of my favorite classmates um, and teammates on the baseball team was this guy. Uh, he had an accident involving a semi-trailer several weeks later and uh, actually had a fairly significant injury as a result of, uh, again, the, the belting uh, lack thereof. Another uh, really good friend of mine during elementary school, kind of grew apart during high school, but a, a great guy. Uh, had a uh, other vehicular accident and was unbelted and uh, died of his injuries as well. Uh, Donna died at the scene, George died at the scene, and Leonard died at the scene as well. These are just pictures from my high school yearbook that I just uh, took as a result. Of I had another good friend that I played baseball with. He went to a neighboring high school uh, in Burton, Texas, and he uh, also was involved in vehicular trauma. Again, uh, as a result of the unbelting thing, uh, lost his life. And then one of my friends from high school, really good uh, track athlete, he was in a car driving with four of four of our friends and uh, lost control of the car. None of them were belted and he was ejected and uh, killed and died at the scene. Uh, this one uh, was also involved in the accident and was ejected and uh, was a thoracic level or you know chest level paraplegic. And he, he lived until 2016, he actually died as a result of his paraplegia in 2016 but lived essentially his entire adult life. This guy was also involved in part of this unbelted thing and uh, he's uh, still with us, uh, but uh, lives with a thoracic level uh, paraplegia as well. And then uh, Don was in the accident with them as well. And on, as a result of getting tossed around in the car without being belted, got a fairly significant head injury that he lived with until 2010 when he eventually committed suicide. So uh, then there's one more uh, who I don't have a picture of, uh, Bubby. Bubby was a friend of mine from Chapel Hill from my hometown, and he was involved in a separate truck accident, no, no belt, and of course 
had a pair a paraplegia and then ended up dying as a result of a pulmonary embolism. So of all these classmates over an 18 month period of time in my hometown, in my small little high school, these were the things that uh, had occurred as a result of uh, these, and, and one, one or two had survived. So um, I would just highlight this one friend of mine here uh, who was in the wreck where the, the four guys were in the car. He was the only one that wasn't injured. You know, one had the head injury, one had the paraplegia, a couple had the paraplegia, one had the death. He, he was uninjured, but uh, this picture of our team was taken a couple of weeks after that accident. And uh, he, you can, I think you can see the, he's going to school and he's trying to function, but you know, the trauma that, that you get from in, uh, in injuries like this, when even when you're uninjured and everyone around you is paraplegic or dead, it, it carries a load. <clears throat> so these, these accidents and the patients that we take care of, they're not just uh, broken, there's this fallout that occurs as a result of not being uh, belted. And so it's not always just the death, it's, you know, it's the family has to go on. And then if there, if there is a death, you know, it's not very much of a hero celebration. It's just, we're, we're always dying before our time when we're involved in these types of situations. There's also the emotional impact if you're having trouble and you are, are involved in an accident with other people where other people are hurt, the, the victims' families are off, off, often uh, really terribly affected by this as well. And this is, um, you know, the, the physical impact of this is not just, uh, it's not just not the emotional impact, but the physical impact is incredible. And so, so many of the patients we take care of, we can restore their bones. We use uh, devices, you know, like this nail that we put inside the bone. We make uh, holes inside the bone and put the nail in. And you can imagine how the bone above and the bone below where the fracture is, is held together by this nail. And there's holes in the bone where the screws can go through to, to hold it. We have a variety of these different, you know, devices that we use to put things back together. But the patients go on and they usually carry some residual of disability. And so when there's quadriplegia or paraplegia, this is a quadriplegic patient. You can see uh, not much works other than just his shoulder shrug works. And so he's got lack of function for long term with the, the, the you know, all the dignity sort of goes away. This is what he looked like in 1975, uh, this same guy. He was involved, another one of my classmates from high school and was quite a football player, and really a great uh, hay hauler, probably the toughest guy I went to high school with. I, I recently um, had to operate on him and uh, as a result of his injuries and uh, from back in those days, I won't go into all that, but you know, I, I asked him, I just said, man, I remember we were back in high school, you were the toughest guy in high school. I'm really sorry you've had to live your whole life with this, you know? And, because he was injured in 1978, and uh, he just said, oh, I wasn't the toughest. He started telling me stories about guys who went to high school who were tougher than him, but at least in my memory, he was the toughest guy in my high school. But again, just a, a separate accident you can see here where just uh, the simple acts of being safe could have uh, saved him a life. And he lived 38 years with a C5 quadriplegia, which means he just could shrug his shoulders and needed total care couldn't really do anything for himself. And so uh, he eventually, he died just a couple of years ago as a result of just uh, the overwhelming, and you know, just the, the disease itself. The spinal cord injury, you know, goes along with other things. You know, it's hard for people to take care of themselves. They can't feel their skin. So they get pressure sores and things like this. It becomes quite, quite expensive and just all the needs. Are, it's, it's a really cumbersome way to live. And then I'm just going to sort of uh, wrap this up just to let you know of you know, we, we take care of a lot of patients that have a lot of problems, but they can still do well. Um, but I'll just give you an example of uh, this, this young guy who was just a passenger in a car, but the driver was, you know, distracted and they weren't belted and they had a rollover accident. And this is him about nine months or a year after his injury. But these are some of his injuries that you can see. And you can see the x-ray in the top left and the 3D modeling on the top right are the same. And that's just a fairly terrible fracture of his pelvis. He's got a head injury. That's his brain CT down below on the right. And then you can see he's broken his femur in on both sides. And if you can see my cursor, it's broken here on the right, broken up here by the hip joint, and then broken down here uh, by the knee as well. So he's got, you know, pretty overwhelming injuries. And you know, each one of us has a zone of expertise. My, one of my partners does spine. I do mostly pelvis trauma. A couple of my partners do uh, 
lower extremity trauma and reconstruction of the knee and things like that. And so these are all the different surgeons that took care of this guy, just putting him back together. And this is sort of what he looked like after we did his elbow injuries and his pelvis injury and linked up his pelvis to his spine and fixed his forearm and fixed his femurs and things like that. And that, that looks like a, a whole lot of work and it all sort of goes back and he heals. But this is just some of the costs. These are just the implant costs just to put these plates and screws and all this stuff. That's just $10,000 worth of implants and 25 or more hours of the operating and the operating room is expensive as well. So you can just see how many hours it took to fix all the different aspects of his injuries. And then when you do the, you start running the, if you're an accountant or you, if, if money in, interests you, uh, you can see all the expenses of what it costs to have an on-scene evaluation, the emergency room, the ICU, 6,000 bucks a day. He was there for 15 days. You can do the math on all this other stuff, but you can see that, yeah, just the, the cost of putting people back together becomes pretty expensive. So um, what I would say to you is that uh, it's, it's better to do the things that y'all are doing. Y'all are on a great program to try to, um, you know, not just promote safety for yourself, but to promote safety amongst your peers and the people around you. And that's, that's incredibly important because you can't have enough. There's so many cheerleaders in life for all the things that could get you into trouble. And there are not a lot of cheerleaders in life for doing the things that keep you out of trouble. And so if you're a seatbelt advocate or a not distracted driving advocate, those are all really good things to do. And that keeps you away from people like me uh, because we just sort of see people on the very, very worst day of their lives and do our very best to put them all back together to make them functional. But there's always these residuals that go along with it. And I've given you a bunch of examples of my classmates that I grew up with. And those are some of my very best friends in high school that just got yanked away from us as a result of not being belted or um, they didn't get yanked away from us, but their labs and their functionalities got yanked away from them as a result at the very young ages of 16 and 17 years old, where they never had a chance to function as an adult without some type of disability. And then I'm trying to also just let you know that, you know, we deal with the physical aspect of this, and then we deal somewhat with the emotional aspect of the trauma that our patients have, but we're, we're nowhere as skilled as we need to be to deal with all that. And, and it goes just, it percolates completely through the families and all their friends and their relationships. And then the financial aspects of it we've touched on. And I think that that's not a great surprise. So I, I would just say, continue to be very, very smart, just like a great batter. I don't know if any of you like baseball, but I, I love to watch batters that are very good. And you have to be prepared. You, you really have to be smart, especially in today's world. You have to have a personal safety plan. And I think the, the belting and, and not distracted driving are two of the greatest personal safety plans of beyond not smoking and stuff like that, uh, that you can imagine. You, you do have to prepare yourself for every situation and equip yourself. And, and that includes the things that y'all know about, but then also know your opponent and your opponent is sometimes some of your best friends. Sometimes it's strangers and sometimes it's just getting yourself in a situation that you, you should have avoided. And I think uh, y'all are great um, advocates for this type of uh, behavior and sharing that with your peers. I would just say that, you know, um, number, tw number 44, uh, unfortunately, had medical problems that cost his life very early. And we lost him way too young as a result of just having other problems. But uh, the other three of us between this, we were really good friends, the four of us. And then the three of us uh, have kept up uh, and you can see here, we were at a Texans game, but you can still see that this guy, he's never really gotten away from all this trauma that happened in 75 or 74. And he still just kind of looks like he's still suspicious of everything. So I would tell you that life is too much fun to miss out on things like that. So keep yourself smart and keep yourself safe. And I think you'll have a great life as well. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to come and speak to you all. I really uh, am impressed with the work that you're doing. It has great value. Don't ever forget that. And the hardest work always does have the greatest value. And the rewards come from within, not from without. So don't, don't go around looking for rewards. You just know that the good work that you're doing is, is helping people. Thank you very much for having me. And I, I hope this has helped you. If any of you are interested in careers in orthopedic traumatology, 
I'm getting old and so I'll need a replacement and you can come on, I'll teach you everything you need to know. Good luck and thank you very much. with the TDS Team Advisory Report. A quick thank you to our presenters and to you for attending this session. Congratulations to the prize winner. You will receive your gift card in the email used to register for the summit. A recording of the session will be available tomorrow. And don't forget to take the survey. Have a great rest of your day.